So what would life be like if every morning we woke up and we recognized that we are one, that we belong to each other, and we're all just walking each other home? That's what we do here at Unity. And it is important that we regularly build bridges of understanding. We knock down the walls that have divided us, and we build bridges of understanding. For this month, we have spent time uh, hanging out with a, a Sufi, hanging out with someone from the Baha'i tradition, hanging out with those that follow the Himalayan traditions and those that follow African traditions. Last week, we got involved in remembering the foundation of the earth-based traditions. And today, I'm so uh, thrilled and delighted to be able to dig into the hearts, the spirits, and the minds of my two friends here to the right. I've asked them to read a, a, a reading or a poem or a prayer from their faith tradition, and then I will also offer a, a song, and then we will get into the message where we'll get the basic tenets of our belief systems. I invite you to have the eyes and the ears and the heart to find the similarities. You know, this whole month we realized we call ourselves new thought. We're not that new at all. It's old thought revisited through a different lens. We're all wearing a different pair of glasses, but it's the same truth that we're looking at. It's the same essence. And so I invite you to open up your heart for just a reading, a poem, and then a little song, and then we'll get into the message. Preeti Bhatt from The Art of Living. Sure. So this is an excerpt um, from a talk that Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar gave on the eternal nature of life. Life is eternal. We never do give a thought to this truth. When someone dies, we declare the person is immortal, but the truth is we ourselves are immortal too. That is why we do not feel we've grown old, no matter how old a person is, he or she feels. They're never gonna die. If someone else dies, we say, oh, that poor fellow died, da da da. There is a stream of awareness within us that cannot be destroyed. To acknowledge and observe this stream is spirituality. I have not changed. I have not grown old. I'm just the same. This brings such courage and strength in life that nothing can shake you. Examining your life, observing it is spirituality. What is the most important truth of life? There is an element within me that does not perish, that does not diminish and is deathless. If you direct even the slightest attention to it, life becomes easy, uncomplicated. The second truth is everything changes. The body undergoes many changes, so does the mind, so do our thoughts. Knowing that everything is changing stabilizes you. When you are established in its truth, such a smile blossoms from within you that can never fade or be robbed away. If we change ourselves, we can change our environment, our society, and this world. How do we make this smile unshakable? How do we make our time on the planet meaningful? Being human, we all have certain needs, certain responsibilities. And if our needs are more than responsibilities, then there is some unhappiness in life. If our responsibilities are more than needs, life will be peaceful. We need to reduce our desires and take on more responsibility. And when in our life, personal needs disappear, desires no longer exist, an extraordinary mystical ability is awakened within us that enables us to bless others. When we do not want anything for ourselves, we develop the strength to fulfill the desires of others. And that's the second step we have to climb. First, become aware of the desires. And whatever desires are left, have the confidence that by God's grace, they will be fulfilled. That next step is, I need nothing. When you need nothing, you will become so strong that whatever you say to anyone will become a blessing. If you bless anyone, it will manifest. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. And now I'm going to, we'd like to hear from Jagjit Sidhu from the Sikh tradition.
Yeah, first I'm going <clears> to <throat> admit that I'm not as good a singer as you just heard before me. <laughs> <laughs> And the second thing, yeah, after I retired from Georgia Tech about 10 years ago, so I started to learn how to play this instrument. It's called harmonium. It's similar to the uh, piano, has the same keys, but I pump it from here, the air, and then it plays from here. And the poem I'm going to read, I won't translate the whole thing, but I'll just start with just two lines. It says, I take pride in you. You are my only strength, Lord. You are my understanding, intellect, and knowledge. I know only what you cause me to know, Lord. तुझे ऊपर मेरा है माना तुझे ऊपर मेरा है माना तू है मेरा ताना राम सूरत मत चतराई तेरे जाना जाना राम तू जाना जाना राम तुझे ऊपर मेरा है माना सोई जान सोई पहचान जा को नदर से रंदे सोई जाने सोई पहचाने जा को नदर से रंदे मनमुख पुली सोनी नाही हाथी माया फंदे मनमुख पुली बहुती राहे फाथी माया फंदे फाथी माया फंदे फाथी माया फंदे तुझे ऊपर मेरा है माना तुझे ऊपर मेरा है माना तू है मेरा ताना राम सूरत मत चतराई तेरे तू जाना And so, from ancient melodies to more contemporary unity melodies, This is the song that we started our series with, and it felt appropriate to put a, a bow on it with ending with this one. Millions of stars placed in the sky by one God. Millions on earth lift up their eyes to one God. So many children calling to God by many a different name. One spirit loving each the same. Many the ways all of us pray to one God. 
many the paths winding their way to one God. Sisters and brothers, there were no strangers after God's work was done. For your God and my God are one God. Yes, children, your God and my God are one. So as I said, we're building bridges of understanding. We're knocking down the walls of Orthodox religion that have absolutely put them up and divided us. And if we're ever going to have peace on the planet, there has to be peace among our world religions. And so we are doing this month long to introduce these various aspects of different religions that are taking our new thoughts and making them old. Or maybe we're taking their old thoughts and making them new. Whatever it is, it matters very little. It matters much more that we connect the dots and that we belong to each other regardless of how we look, we think, we feel, or our background. And so I've asked Preachy to introduce you to the art of living, a little bit of the principles of this movement. Thank you, Richard. I was saying earlier this morning, I don't know what to say. Art of living is simply the art of living. <laughs> it seems so simple, and yet it is so difficult. Right? So the art of living, I would call, is the philosophy of life that allows us to simplify our life. It has become so complex in the pursuit of making everything comfortable, convenient, faster, more efficient, somewhere we are moving away from the very goal that we think we're doing everything, that we're doing every single moment of our life. We're running faster so that we can relax. Where is the time to relax? There is no time to relax because there is so much to do. There is always so much to do. So how can we get back to the basics? Because a disease-free body, a quiver-free breath, a stress-free mind, an inhibition-free intellect, an obsession-free memory, an ego that is all-inclusive, all-embracing, and a sorrow-free soul is the birthright of every human being. Yeah. So how can we empower each individual to get back to these basic rights of ours, to live life more smoothly, more graciously, more gracefully? So we bring in all kinds of tools and techniques that there are to get this mind to that state that it was born with. That energy, that love, that compassion, that contentment, that is within us, all these values. And it's no different from you know, unity principles. What we do is we add a touch of yogic wisdom, we add a touch of breath work, meditation, breath, is what can bring us to the here, to the now. At a physiological level, you know, 80 to 90% of the toxins in the system can be released through the breath, and we explore the power of the breath using these powerful ancient breathing techniques to allow us to let go. As long as we hold our fist tight, there's only so much that we're able to hold. In fact, we're barely able to hold anything. But when we're able to release and let go, then the entire sky is in our palms. Yeah? So that's what the art of living is. How do we bring back that smile that is within us? Yes, there are a lot of things outside that seemingly bring us joy and happiness. 
right? All those comforts that we seek, and there's absolutely nothing wrong about it. It's great to recognize, celebrate, and be grateful for all the blessings that we've been given in this world, and yet having the wisdom to come back. Because that source of joy, that source of contentment, peace, all of that is here within us. So no matter whether, I don't know, is Tesla the in thing these days? Maybe, because you see so many of them around here in Atlanta all of a sudden, yeah. Whether we get that dream Tesla or not, isn't it? Can I still be content and joyful and still seek to achieve my goals and my ambitions and my desires in life? Can I make life an expression of joy and not get caught up in this trap of being it, making it a pursuit of joy and happiness? So that, in a nutshell, is what I would say is Art of Living, the philosophy and the teachings of Art of Living are centered around. Beautiful, thank you. And one thing I know about all of the, our partners, all the people I've met from Art of Living, pre t being, of course, at the top, these are not just words or ideas, they are lived. In, the, in her presence, everything she just said is lived, and it is felt, and it is known. And so, uh, Jagjit, would you uh, introduce us to the Sikh tradition? I, I, I feel a little bit funny asking people to encapsulate their entire faith tradition in five <laughs> minutes or less, but uh, I think that he can do it. Yeah, before I do that, I want to have a little story on art of living. <laughs> Uh, when they were here about 20, 25 years ago, not too many people, and they were holding these sessions for Art of Living, and I wasn't sure if I should go. I said, maybe it's some cult or something. I, I, then I sent my wife for the... <laughs> I, I, I said, Rani, why don't you go try it? And she came back and she said, there is something there, yeah. <laughs> so then, then I went and uh, I'm glad I did. <laughs> okay, about, uh, first of all, it's, some people even, uh, Richard asked me, how do you pronounce? It's Sikh, S-I-K-H. It's not Sikh, it's Sikh. Uh, so the interesting thing is that uh, the Sikh, history and the United States history go pretty much in parallel. America was founded in 1492. Our first guru was born in 1469. So he was about 20, 25 years old. When everything was happening here, things were happening back in India also. And Guru Nanak, our first guru, he was born in a Hindu family. Uh, as he grew up, even when he was, uh, from the stories I hear, when he was even uh, like that little girl, four years old, who was singing that song, so he started to question some of the traditions in both the Hindu and the Muslim religion. And he was saying some of the things are not practical. And he was a very practical person saying, okay, um, would example will be people will be throwing water toward the sun and they say, why are you doing that? Oh, we're sending it to our uh, parents and grandparents who died. And he started to f throw water towards his fields. And they said, how can the water reach there? He said, if the water can't reach to your <laughs> ancestors, my so he will go by example. He went to Mecca and he was lying uh, over there at night and his feet were toward the uh, holy, holy side and they said uh, you can't have your feet toward the holy side and Guru Nanak said then okay move my feet where there is not God and uh, so he was kind of a practical he'll go and give the practical examples and he did not uh, sit home he traveled miles and miles he'll go to the holy places of the Hindus, he'll go to the holy places of Muslims, and then he will converse them, talk to them, and see what, 
why are you doing certain things? And that's how, so we, we have 10 gurus, after he passed, he passed down to, so our last guru, he passed, he left this uh, earth in 1708. So in 200 and some 50 years, we have the writings from the gurus and it's combined into a holy book. We call it Guru Granth Sahib. So when in our church, the center part, the whole attraction is about that holy scriptures. So we bow not to the holy book, but we bow to the knowledge in that holy book. And when the 10th Guru passed away, people asked him, what are we going to do now? And he said, this is your living Guru in the sense, if you have any questions, go read, there is an answer in that. So that's what, and it's all written in poetic form, like what I sang is also from that. And so basically it started very like a passive religion, but in the middle about the sixth Guru time, there were rulers in India. Now I'm not going to say it's the, against the religion, but the uh, rulers were Muslim rulers, but they were not following the Muslim traditions. So they were converting the Hindus by force to Muslims. And then our gurus, even though didn't believe in either one, but they fought for the Hindus. They said, if they want to convert on their own, there is no problem, but you cannot force people to convert from one religion to another. And actually one guru, they even, uh, he lost his life for fighting for that. And then his son was the 10th guru. And uh, so we are combination of, it is the first time in the history, people used to say, okay, if you are a holy person, you're supposed to be very passive. And there are people who are in the army, they are supposed to fight the wars. But the Sikhs, they are called Sant Sipahi. That means you can be a religious person, you can be a saint soldier. That is the definition of it. So we, if there is anything, even in, now in India or any place else, if there is anything wrong going on, the Sikhs will stand up and fight for it. If you even see in the Ukraine, or whenever there is a tsunami, you would see the Sikhs are feeding the people over there. And that's part of our religion. And in, in, in any Gurdwara, which is our temple, you can go any time, you will be served food. At our golden temple in Amritsar, almost 100 to 200,000 people eat every day. And it's, it's open to any religion. Doesn't have to be Sikh. It, anybody can come. And that's why we have four doors at our temple that it is open to all religions. And, and, and you, you would be surprised that it has, we, like even our <laughs> temple here, we don't have a membership. We do not ask for donations, but we never run out of money. Whenever we need it, it comes. We started it, uh, one in Roswell here. We were just 14, 15 families. We bought it. People, are, people have paid the mortgage. So it's a very, it's a, uh, Sikh religion runs in a very different form. Now, again, like any religion, there are liberals and there are external. So that's, that's true in any. Uh, so I'm kind of in the middle. <laughs> so if you want to be really baptized, you are supposed to Okay, there are five things that we are supposed to keep. It's uh, our hair, we never cut our hair. Then you are supposed to wear this bracelet 
this is kind of a like uh, what would Jesus say like if you have on your right hand side it's a reminder you're not going to do something wrong right <laughs> and then we're supposed to have uh, special underwear and then supposed to carry a sword and that sword is not for offense it is for a defense if you see something wrong going on you are supposed to stand up and uh, it is one other biggest difference I would say with any religion is we do not believe in converting. If you want to, you are free. But if you are a Christian, be a good Christian. If you are a Muslim, be a good Muslim. If you are a Hindu, be a good Hindu. So we don't say that this is the only way. We say there are multiple ways, but whatever. If you are, like I'm a Sikh because or in a, in a family. I didn't, but I, I think I'm happy where I am. I have, we are four brothers, two of us, we are turban, two when they came here in order to mix it maybe, and uh, they did cut their hair. But it's, see, America is, I mean, I came here 53 years ago, and I love this place because of the independence or the free thought that we have here. Uh, I'll tell you a story. One of my brother, he's a, he's a doctor. He came from India and a couple of months he felt he was looking for residency. He could not, re he, he didn't, he wasn't patient enough. So he, he, he cut his hair. He thought he's not getting residency because he's wearing a turban. And he goes to in Texas, Galveston, for an interview. And when he walked in, the director said, I was expecting somebody with a turban. <laughs> because from his name, and we are, actually, yeah, another big thing about the secret, we don't have a caste system. And our gurus, yes, and our gurus, actually, at that time, there were castes in India. And they say, and you can recognize somebody's caste from his last name. So what Guru Gobind Singh, our 10th Guru said, everybody is going to have the last name as Singh, which means a lion. And every female is going to have the last name as a Kaur, K-A-U-R, mean princess. So that way you cannot tell from where, what is your background. Is that enough time? Or? Yeah, so, thank you. So what you're hearing, you know, universally is, is what unity teaches, the, the, the oneness of all people, the equality of all people, and standing up for that which is not right. You know, we do, as pacifists, as peacemakers, we are not uh, immune from putting ourselves in the line of fire. But I thought I would start with something funny about the unity movement to really give a clear picture of what unity is all about. A priest, a pagan, an atheist, a rabbi, and a unity minister are taking a hike together in the woods, and they come upon a burning bush consumed by fire. And when they hear a mysterious voice out of nowhere say, I am that I am, the Christian immediately grabs a stone and prepares to take dictation. The pagan starts smudging and calling in the ancestors from the south. The atheist starts digging in the ground for the CD player and propane tank. The rabbi runs as fast as he can, exclaiming that the last time they listened to a burning bush, the Jews ended up lost for 40 years. <laughs> the unity minister, he pulls out his marshmallows and he struggles with how to keep the fire burning long enough for the congregation to show up with graham crackers and chocolate. So, we feel, I feel so relatively small as a unity minister compared to the depth of, of knowledge and spirituality of my colleagues. I'm going to really quickly just go through a, re, a review of the unity precepts. There is only one power, one presence, one good, one light, one song, one everything. There's not two. So unity takes the devil away. That's a human construct, a mental construct to try to understand uh, why bad things happen. And basically means shirking responsibility. Two is a construct of the human ego. There is only one of us here. Say that with me. There is only one of us here. 
And it's easy to do here, but the reality is it's not so easy to walk the face of the earth and realize that there's only one of us everywhere. And our job is to find that face of God, and if we have missed it, we are the ones that have missed it. No matter the behavior, no matter the, the reality in the moment, we are the ones that have missed it. It's our job to look deeper. A second unity principle is if there is only one of us, there's only one presence and power, then guess what? This Christ that we have been told for so long is the great exception, is not the exception, but the great example, reminding us of who we are. You are holy, you are sacred, you are beautiful, you're magnificent. And so that spark of divinity exists in each and every one of us. And repeat that after me. The spark of divinity exists in me. And as that spark of divinity, that means we are created in the image and after the likeness of God, we are creative. How do we create? Our thoughts are creating our reality. What we are thinking is making heaven or hell on earth. What we are feeling is creating heaven or hell. What we are doing with our hands and our bodies is creating heaven or hell. So if you don't like what you're experiencing, change your thinking. Change your feeling. Change your actions and be a part of turning things around. It's the great fall from grace that we, we believed as a human race that there was God and anything else. And our job is to turn that boat around and get back to the Garden of Eden and say, I can clean up my stinking thinking. I can clean up the stinking feelings and I can take a more loving, compassionate, kind action and then I am part of returning to the Garden of Eden. How do we do that? Prayer and meditation. Now, I've got a master meditator here to my right, but Unity says we must absolutely be immersed in a regular practice of prayer and meditation. Uh, Preeti said for service, oh, but many people think they can come to Sunday morning and then they'll, they'll be enlightened or something like that. If you come here on Sunday morning thinking that you're going to find enlightenment, I hate to let you down. This is about that much of the process of a regular daily practice of checking in with headquarters, soul quarters, spirit quarters, and recognizing the truth at a spiritual level, because all we talk about is spiritual, not human. Nothing is against you in this world. Oh, at the human level, it can feel that way. But our job is to get busy in the quiet place, the upper room, if you will, the higher consciousness, to develop our consciousness that sees God when nobody else can see it, that finds love and expresses love when nobody else can find it or see it. That's our job, and we do that through prayer, meditation, and the word, the magic word of unity is silence. And silence is not the absence of sound. Silence is the awareness that, as Jesus taught us, the Father and I are one. And we say in unity, the mother and I are one. We cannot be separate from that which we are. And then out of our prayers, get busy. We are responsible to making the world a better place. And so I'm going to ask my colleagues, based on that fifth principle, use your body. Use your body. Use your hands. Give feet to your prayers. Give feet to your meditations. Either one of you can answer, what does your faith tradition teach about service to the world and to humanity. Well, in the Sikhism, I mean, that's the basic thing for us. It is how you service everybody. So you treat them equal, so then you don't see a difference. So if somebody is in trouble, it doesn't, you don't see Okay, he's not a Sikh, so I'm not going to... So I think it's... We look that we are created by one God and we came from the same source. So it does not matter how you... What your color is, what your religion is. We treat... When there is a need, our, our religion teaches us, you got to help. And that's, I think, uh, from the childhood, that's what we... And sometimes we get in trouble because... <laughs> We put our nose into something that needs, needs some help. But some people will say, why did you get into helping somebody if there was a fight going on? What, why? You say, well, I'm supposed to do it. So that's how we are brought up. Yeah. When we're tight, stressed, we can barely be responsible for our own emotions, our own actions, and our own thoughts, let alone even the people living in our own home, household, community, neighborhood. 
But when we can fill our cup, we can experience that joy, that blessings and gratitude in our life, then a natural expression is to give. And that is what we believe. When we experience love, the form of expressing it outside is service giving so that we can make this world a better place for everyone else for the next generations to come and that is what services to us and i know richard loves to say this always we are a completely volunteer based organization one of the largest volunteer based organizations in the world so our all our work is solely driven by inspiration and everyone is giving you know, their time, effort, resources to give back. So my next question is, we look at the world as we see it today, and it can be pretty dark. Anybody notice that? Yeah. Dualism is living everywhere on the planet today. We have, we have made wars, we've made enemies. And in the unity tradition, you know, we like to carry Jesus' words a step further. Um, he said, love your enemies. But we say you have no enemies. If you are living from the spiritual truth, you have no enemies. But I would love, love to know what your tradition does when looking at the darkness and the violence of the world, what does it teach about our responsibility to do something? Well, practically, I mean, if something is happening someplace else, if I can't help in the sense directly, then there is something that we believe everything that's happening here is in the will of God. So what is happening, let's say some turmoil, some, it's still happening in his will. So one way is, yes, you have to accept it, but if you can help monetarily, physically, you should do that. But again, it's very hard to decide which side you want to take, right? So, if you are dividing that way, okay, I'm gonna send money to this place. No, generally, we go, we help. If we are feeding somebody, it doesn't matter which side it is. So I think uh, in Sikhism, a lot of stuff is that you have to accept his will. And that to me is, yeah, if there is fighting going on in Middle East, fighting going on in Ukraine, it's in his will, but if some, if he will put some sense into people's mind to get it resolved. So. Unity would say that the sense has already been placed into our mind, we have to wake up to it. That uh, it, we would they draw a little different parallel, it's that God is a circle, there are no sides in the circle. Ours is to love and to love more readily. So Preeti. All I will say is, behind every culprit, there is a victim crying for help somewhere. They're just a victim of their circumstances, of ignorance, of just the way they've been educated to believe that their cause is the right cause. And to us, it does not seem right. Yes, and in the process of someone's ending up hurting someone, what can we do to bring light wisdom and just shift that passion that they have for that cause into a passion that is more constructive, more positive. That's the only switch that needs to be turned around. Yeah? And that's the premise of our whole work. Enliven that light that is within us, that is right here inside of us. It's just been overshadowed with some clouds, some veils of ignorance and stresses and past experiences and impressions and you know, empower people to allow that to clear out. And when that clears out, when there's 100% light in a room, there is no room for darkness because darkness is not a substance. It is just the absence of light. Right? So, how can we focus on that aspect of education? Education for a, a better world, not just for ourselves, but for others around us. Richard, I'll just add something that our 10th Guru, he said that if all the means to resolve a problem are exhausted, 
fighting for it is a pious. That if, if you see that something is really going wrong and you have used all the means to resolve it and at the end if you have to fight for it, you go for it. So Unity, I'm going to invite the band to come up. Um, Unity would just say, if you want more love in the world, give more love away. You want more peace in the world, be more peaceful. We are contributing. We are, through the collective consciousness, adding with everything we're doing on the planet to the darkness or the light. Be more of that you want to see.